when do we use faith? Normally, it's towards the things that are impossible within our life. But who really defines what's impossible? You know, when we look at this world and we judge the things that are impossible, normally it's towards gain, getting stuff. Whether it be towards that spouse you've once longed for, or maybe it's that job coming out from graduation. But there's another impossibility that a lot of people consider, which is living to God's standard. But God turns back that saying and says what's impossible with man becomes possible with God. So it's not about just getting up out of your bed in order to live, only to question what you're living by. But understand, as you wake up, you're living by faith. Where faith is applied. This is coming from Romans 4, verse 1 through 5. It says, What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? So, what we need to understand here is Abraham being the father of all things. But when we look at him, sometimes we may boast of the flesh. Just like in our daily lives. We sometimes believe that we found everything just because we have more money than what we had yesterday. But in this very question in the first verse, it's really asking us, well, why are we here? Why are we on earth? Are we really that wise? Are we really, really that strong? So let's keep on reading to understand what the true meaning of life is and how we apply faith to it. And verse 2, it says, For if Abraham were justified by works, he have were of the glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So clearly it says here that we may do things in God while we're serving God, rather, like feeding the homeless or helping the poor or just helping someone who's around us who's in need, maybe our neighbor. But oftentimes we do that as a work. And what I mean by that is we say, well, we should do this or we should do that. And honestly, you get tired of that kind of rationale because soon enough you're going to say, well, this poor person is just going to spend the money or my time, you know, on something that is unprofitable. But when you understand that you've been bought with a price and that all the things in which you gained in God, like the ability to believe in something higher and greater than yourself and than your problems, you understand that you just have to walk, learn to walk by faith. So faith is applied in living, living towards the goals of God. When God tells you to give or when God tells you to go a certain place, we live by faith, understanding that we are justified by him. Because it says here in another portion, for what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Abraham did something that wasn't very popular. Just like many of us know that is not the most popular thing to serve God. And even if we could define serving God, we look at Jesus Christ. Okay, so living to the standard of Jesus Christ, as he says, be perfect even as the Heavenly Father is perfect. Now we have a goal that we have to reach. So it goes on to four to say how now to him that worketh is reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Now, a lot of people believe that just because you're helping the poor and you're helping your neighbor and you're just helping everyone that comes along your way that you're going to gain eternity. But when you look at the grace of God, when you look at the power of God, when you look at how the heavens have been framed, 
How could your work ever repay God? But rather, if God tells you to do something and you do it, that's meat for something worthy of God's eternal life. So it's not necessarily doing works that are clearly written down in the Bible, but obeying His voice. If you're able to obey His voice like Abraham did, then we have something to glory about. Then we have something to praise God about. Then we have righteousness. But in 5 it says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Because you understand clearly that, hey, I could work morning, noon, and night and still not repay God. So what could I render to God for all his benefits toward me? Just obey him. And then you should ask yourself, well, when? All the time. Because God is the same God on the mountain as he is in the valley. Which means that whatsoever hardship you may feel you're going through, that may feel that is greater than yourself and you feel that you cannot overcome, just understand God is greater than it all. Just obey. Because through obedience, you also find the answer. And the answer to life is an obedience to God. Faith and works. This is coming from Romans 4, verse 6 through 10. And it says in verse 6, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God it imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned, when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. So once you understand the work of God, and you understand that he was once towards the people of Israel, and that the Gentiles were cast out, a people that were literally forgotten in the eyes of God. We then understand that there's a blessedness that happens once we're able to think of someone other than ourselves. This is not because you're that great of a person. This is not just because you're that blessed. It's just because God moves within a time that you could now be yoked to him or connected to him. We now feel the connection of God when we're able to do something that is good. Because when we're in the world, we're doing things that are bad. Doing the things that cannot profit us. Now, if we just base being in God and living in God by works, there's people of the world that are doing works. Some that are donating much money in comparison to what you may give. But it's different when you're giving based off of faith. Because faith is giving something that you do not have or providing something in which you don't necessarily have in your possession. You're doing things that are not popular. And I think that's the theme of this message. Because many a times we move because we have money. We move because we have the time. But when God tells us to move, yet we're in a time or in a place where we don't have the time, nor we don't have the resources in order to do what God commands us to do, then we have to move by faith. So faith tends to allow us to move out of our comfort zone to a place where God could use us. So when you look at the blessedness, Marked in verse 8. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So he has forgiven you. But why has he forgiven you? Because he will not put his spirit on an earthen vessel. So you cannot work the works of faith and be an earthen vessel. An earthen vessel basically means that you're living contrary to the word of God. You know, you think carnally. You think vanity. 
Just like what I mentioned before, you're not going to be able to give if you don't have the money to give. You're not going to take from your bills in order to give to someone, regardless of whether God is telling you to give it or not. But when you learn to live by the Spirit and tap into the Spirit, man, then you can understand that it's not about my might or by my strength, but by the Spirit, saith the Lord. So it's not just to the Jews, it's not just to the Gentiles either, it's to everyone who lives by faith. Sometimes we want to put God in this box and say, well, you know, if we're in this box, we're justified. But even we judge ourselves and we look at, well, are we perfect? Are we living to God's standard every day? No. So... Wouldn't we be out of that box some days and in that box another? Isn't that just contrary in the way that God works? He says, who I call blessed is blessed and who I call cursed is cursed. So when we're living to the standard of God, working by faith, of course, because we haven't yet attained perfection, yet we're working within perfection, being that God is perfect and his ways are perfect. So now that we're molding our ways to perfection, then he is cleaning us up. And the cleaning that he does is a continual cleaning. And he's not going to stop cleaning. And once you're going to look back on your past or maybe you could look to your neighbor, you're going to understand that I used to be that person, but I'm no longer that person. Why? Because God is cleaning you up. So if we were to judge perfection as being able not to do the things that you once did, then you're already perfect. But you don't boast yourself of that, right? Because then you're talking about works. But rather you allow God to justify you by allowing you to continue in faith. So now we're starting to understand that faith is a blessing, a blessing that not everyone could receive. Because it sounds crazy to go ahead and just walk by stuff that you cannot see. I'd rather walk by things that I can see. You know, you pay your bills or you're able to help someone based off of how much money you have. You're able to help someone based off how much free time you have. But God's ways are not our ways. Neither are his thoughts, our thoughts. As he told the Peter, cast your hook into the sea. And the first fish that comes up Take out the money that's for you and for me. He will provide for you. And the thing is, he's not just going to provide for one instant, but he's going to provide for your whole life. Faith and works, they work hand in hand. James describes it as, without faith, there's no works. And without works, there's no faith. A man who says he has works without faith his religion is void and vain. But when you learn to speak things into existence, walk to places that you have never walked before, and do it rejoicing in God, then you not only will be rewarded through works, but you will be justified by faith. Faith and the Holy Ghost. This is coming from Romans 4, verse 11 through 14. In verse 11, it says, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. So, let's break this down. Who he's talking about here is Abraham. He received the sign of circumcision while he was yet without circumcision. So what does that mean? Circumcision, which is something that could be interpreted as something fleshly, means nothing at all. So what does it mean? It's a seal. Something that distinguishes you from another. So what could distinguish us? The Holy Ghost. That is something that seals us both now into eternity. It says in another verse, it says, My sheep know my voice, and another they will not follow. The Holy Ghost is interpreted as 
a promise. When we walk by faith, it's not so much that we're just walking blindly, but we understand that God, through his promise, that he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, that we are able to accomplish all in which he calls us to do. So, it's not only to the Jews. Because if we look at the fleshly man and we say, well, okay, if I'm not circumcised, I'm not blessed, you're missing the meaning. The meaning was that God spoke to him to crucify the flesh. How many times God looks at our addictions and says to us to get over them? And then we say, but it's too hard because it's an addiction. But this is a sign of the circumcision. You have to separate yourselves from the things of the flesh in order to enter into the things of the spirit. As it says in the times of Nicodemus, should I enter into my mother's womb again? No, but you've got to be born again. How are we born again? By crucifying the things of the flesh and entering into the spirit and doing the will of the father. It says in 12, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had yet being uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. So what is he saying here? If we are in that same box which we once described, and we say, well, people who are of the law, people who are Jews, people who may be circumcised, people who may be apostolic, these people are saved and holy. Okay, well, there are days where we're not holy. We're not doing the things of God. That doesn't make us justified just because we're part of a group. But when we are of the Holy Ghost, this is the only seal in which we have that justifies us as men and women and children of faith. Without this seal, we are not bought with a price. Because it says, wait for the comforter. This is the only thing in the New Testament that Jesus Christ signifies to his saints, to the apostles, to tarry for, to wait for. Without it, you are not sealed. Without it, you cannot receive the promise that God is with you and he'll never forsake you. So many a times we make the promise of none effect. We look at the Jews and say, well, hey, they followed the law. They said with, without the law, says we're of the law rather, we're perfect, okay? And we're going to enter in. But what do the people of the law do? Do they just read the law every single day? No, we live, we complete, we fulfill the law through faith. So many a times we look and we say, well, Jesus Christ died for us, so there's no reason to work. Even when we do work, our work is not perfect. But when you walk in faith, there's someone who's in darkness, who sees you working, understanding that you're not perfect, understanding that you're framed of the same dust that he or she or they were made of, yet you're working as though you're seeking a higher calling. So it's not so much that you're working to justify yourself. You're working to enlighten and esteem yourself, but not only yourself, but those who are watching. So the next time you consider and say, well, what's the point in even walking when I'm going to be imperfect anyhow? I'm going to be false. I'm going to do it wrong anyway. Consider someone other than yourself. Someone who could just see past their nose someone who cannot understand the mysteries of God and how that he will call you to do things that are not popular be the leader 
and walk by faith. That you will not only have faith, but also the Holy Ghost. Why the Holy Ghost? This is coming from Romans 4, verse 15 through 16. It says in verse 15, Because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace, to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So if you haven't gotten it by now, you should have known that the Holy Ghost is not given to everyone, but is given to the children of promise. That's what is written of in the Old Testament as well as the New. When you're sealed with this promise, you're then doing the works of God, not yet inheriting the blessings of the streets paved with gold and separated from the people of this world. Yet, you understand that greater is within you. So, when you understand that, you understand that where the law is, where we go ahead and we try to manipulate ourselves and alienate ourselves from the commonwealth of God through thinking of God as being, okay, we go to church and we come back home. And we never consider that we have to live towards the expectation of God. Then we deceive ourselves. We transgress the very law which proceeded from the mouth of God. This is why the law was seen as something that's not good. Why? Because people started to read the book and started to understand the letter. And then they said, well, we can't do it. So then it killed. The letter was supposed to edify, even bringing us to a next level in God. Like faith. When we hear about in the times of Joshua, he says, I'm going to send you into a place. You're going to receive this land and you're going to destroy everyone. The direction of God is so clear. The instruction of God is so clear. Yet, it's us who get confused. Because when we start to consider what is before us, we see giants. We see stuff that is considered impossible. We see people who have been weakened in the way. And then we judge ourselves and we judge the word of God and we call it impossible. This is why we have to use the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost is a person which says that I abide in you and you abide in me. And if God abides in you, there's nothing called impossible. Jesus Christ even interpreted it and he says, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall ask this mountain to be removed and it shall be removed. Now we interpret the mountain as something of our trials, of our faith, our tribulations and our weaknesses. But he was speaking of a mountain, a real mountain, as big as it is, yet if you believe it shall be removed, it shall be removed. We speak about the times of Elijah. He prayed that it would not rain. And his fervent prayer was met by the reward of obedience. God hearkening to his voice. And it didn't rain by the space of three years and six months. When he prayed again, it rained. Not that he could be justified, but that he could understand about his relationship with God. Seeing that everyone around him is getting blessed. But if he were to quench the very blessings Seeing that even written down in, in Solomon's time, everyone is satisfied by the field. If that is quenched, what do we live by? We live by faith. We're justified by faith. So this is where the message starts to gain shape. Because it's not only about living by faith, but it's about moving out of your comfort zone. Giving people stuff that you thought you needed. Because God told you to do it. 
When you do things and you just mark it down as a checklist, you're going to get tired. You're going to get weary. But when you move by faith and you're listening, waiting for God's voice in order to get you out of bed, you never get tired. Because every day is exciting. Never knowing what day is going to hold. This is why God had to come through the Holy Ghost and bring to you the Holy Ghost. Without it, you cannot do it. If you ever did it trying to say, okay, I'm going, I'm going to be perfect today. I'm going to get through life. I'm going to help my neighbor. And you failed. You get discouraged. And you never want to try again. But when you have the Holy Ghost, you live one step at a time. Not looking to the future, not saying this is what I'm going to do or that. But God says, I will not put on you anything more than what you can handle. So wait on God. And he will not only give you faith and the Holy Ghost, but he'll give you purpose and a reason to live. Faith is in your favor. This is coming from Romans 4, verse 17 through 19. It says in verse 17, As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickened the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. So, as I said, it's very hard to follow God when you're in the flesh. When you're in the spirit, it's very easy. And what it means to be in the spirit means that you just are in obedience. Okay, so you understand that without the spirit, you're dead. So that means as soon as you wake up, you're living to the expectation of God. So there's no excuse as to why you fall. But if you sin, you have an advocate, which is Jesus Christ, who died for our sins being made a propitiation for our sins. So with that being said, we read on with 18, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. So who is the seed? The seed is us. But let's keep reading. It says in 19, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb so many a times we look at perfection and we say well yes we understand Jesus Christ said be ye perfect in that even as your heavenly father is perfect we read about perfection in the Old Testament we read about perfection in the New Testament yet we are unbelieving why because we go ahead and we say well we're still flesh but if Abraham would have looked at his flesh, he would not have proceeded to get his son, Isaac. So when we look at this, and let's just judge this within the times of now, when we look at, well, people are going to lie, people are going to sin, people are going to fornicate, people are going to adulterate, we have to be different. That's why we're called peculiar. Without peculiarity, no one could distinguish who we are. The Jews were considered different because of the statutes in which they lived by. Because of the statutes in which they lived by, people were then afraid once God justified their actions by destroying the people who came up against them. We see this clearly in the times going through Egypt and how God delivered them with an outreach hand, with the hand of Moses or with the word of Moses, as well as Aaron. So now, it's up to you in this world of sin. What are you going to do? Are you going to listen to everything everyone says? You know, what's, where is the excitement in knowing that, okay, I go to church only to sin again? There's no excitement in that. Jesus died for you. Not the you who you are now, but the you who you could become. Now consider, he was a hundred years old. His flesh is weak. We are made after the similitude of Abraham. The similitude of sin, but yet, when we consider faith, we're esteemed and enlightened. 
that there's a hope, but not only a hope, but a lively hope. Not only to the fact that we listened to God, but we rejoice when we actually do listen and we actually find that he justifies and turns around and justifies us. For we are quickened through the Spirit. Quickened to do what? Do the things of God. But if we are not quickened, then we're dying every single day. Our members, our body is not meant to go ahead and sin. Our members are made to rejoice in God. Why do we say that? Because in the beginning it says, I made man in my own image. But to do what? Just to look good? No, but to serve him. How do we serve him? Through praise and through worship. Through obeying his voice. You have to break out of the mold. You have to be different. God says the same seed in which he says here is going to be accounted for a generation. Isaiah says there's going to be only one seed. A small, a remnant that's going to be able to follow the word of God. And if judgment begins at the household of God, what happens to those who are in the world? So don't be lukewarm and say, well, hey, on Sundays I'm going to be in church, but on the weekends I'm going to do what I got to do. Or maybe you're going to go and use the word of God in some instances within your life, like through arguments or, or when your bills are not being paid. And then through others, you're going to lean to your own understanding. This is all sin. This is all contrary to God's will. But faith works in your favor. Because if you go ahead and you work as unto the Lord, then he says, I will bless your works. God says in a word, he says in Isaiah, he says, try and see if I wouldn't, try me and see if I wouldn't open up the windows of heaven and pour forth a blessing for you. The trying, which means that you live to God's perfection, to God's standard, it is possible. So, it's not so much that you have to pray for stuff any longer, but just ask for strength so that it could work, faith could work within your favor. And if faith will fit, works within your favor, then you not only have favor, but you have God. Mystery. This is Romans 4, verse 19 through 22. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. So when we look at ourselves, when we look at our family, especially when we're married, we, we sometimes say, well, okay, well, I'm in a better place than maybe your spouse. But you have to consider that you're made after the similitude of God, that you could live in his perfection. Okay, his image is the image of perfection, the image of holiness, the image of righteousness. So when you consider the image that God is, the omnipotent power of God, and we're made in his fashion, then what should hinder us from his goodness? It's about time we stop looking at especially our spouses, but even our neighbor and saying, well, we're better. We can't do this. If God has given us strength, use our strength to help one another, not to weaken one another. It says in 20, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. How many times do we hear from God or we have a vision or we have a dream and it speaks to our hearts and it's something profound in which we feel we have to do immediately? And we then are met with the thoughts of unbelief, where we say, well, that sounds strange. Why would we do this? Why did I have this dream? Why did I have this vision? If we are children of God, it says, my sheep know my voice and another they will not follow. Don't forget, he was not weak in faith. If we are the children of Abraham, or rather the children of God, God is never weak. He's always strong. 
So that's a reason to live all by itself. That's a reason why we wake up. Because he died for us. He died that we could have life and then have it more abundantly. The life in which we have is not to gain stuff and then to lose stuff. But it's to gain Christ and to gain eternal life. It says in 21, And being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. See, when we walk, we don't walk and say, well, let's just see what happens. We walk because we believe he's able to do it. Him being called God. He could do all things. If he created the world, he created all things that abide within it. Which means nothing is impossible. So now you're starting to realize if I can't believe God, if I can't do what he tells me I could do, then do I really believe God created the world? Do I really believe he fashioned me? There's some people who say bluntly, I don't believe in God and I don't believe that he created the world. And then there's some who say, well, I believe in God. But when God speaks to you to do something, to give up something, to sacrifice something, we doubt. We are weakened in our faith. But we cannot stumble at this thought and this doctrine. We have to move on. If you understand that you have crucified Christ afresh through your unbelief, then it's about time you wake up. It's never too late. Because if you're hearing this message and it's speaking to your soul, then that's God speaking, not me. That's God's voice, not man's voice. Because conviction happens through God. We could speak morning, noon, and night. That doesn't mean you're going to feel any change. But when you feel as though you could do something, it's because God is working effectually within you and hope is not lost. So get up. Get walking. And live by faith. And be justified by it. Faith leads us to Jesus Christ. This is Romans 4 verse 23 through 35. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. But for us also to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So what does this mean? So when we look at faith. We're understanding that God wants us to move. God doesn't want us to stay the same. So when he cleans us up, this is not something that happens once. But this is something that continues within our life. Now, if you don't begin to walk, you can't begin to live and to understand what you need to do. It's kind of like a job. We all believe that we all know what a job holds because of a description. But when you start to go to the job and start to work within the job, you start seeing the trials and the tribulations, the problems that come. And you start to question yourself and say, wait, this wasn't part of the description of the job. No, it wasn't. But they understood that you would learn things eventually as you begin to walk. This is a form of faith. Now, if you never begin to walk, I don't care what school you go to in order to learn about God or who you listen to, you will never understand. You may become strong, but after a while, when you're not walking in the faith, you're going to get weakened. So... In all, when we look at this, it's not so much about the law and necessarily what Abraham did in terms of, you know, uh, crucifying the flesh through the circumcision. But rather the faith, but in obedience to what? The obedience that will lead him to Christ. Because many a times we want to put ourselves in the box and the box is safety. 
if we go to church, if we go to Bible study, if we pay our tithes, if we pay our offerings, then God will save us. And God will lead us away from harm. But that's not faith. Faith is seeking the things that are eternal, things that not everyone else could do. There's people who give, give great sums of money. But in God's eyes, is it blessed? God knows he could give to the poor if he wants to. He could raise up the dead if he wants to. So where do you fit in the equation? If we're going to be made pillars in God's throne, in God's house, in eternal life, shouldn't we be able, doesn't this reveal how strong we should be? We should be living examples. Christ shouldn't be the only example. If he abides in us, we too can be examples, not only to ourselves, but also to our children. Not only to our children, but the people of the world. Now, I know what you're thinking. These people are not watching us and they don't care. But if they have eyes, they're watching. And the same way that you found this message is not because of luck, but because God wants you to get better. Do better. So, as it says in 25, who was delivered for our offenses and who raised again for our justification. This is not only to the Jews. We do have something great as long as we serve Jesus Christ. Once we serve God, and just like Jesus Christ said, he said, if we go and we live to the standard that he lived, and let me get you the words exactly, he says, you don't have to, as a servant, be greater than the master. But it is me for you to be like the master, that you could gain the blessings of the master. So when you consider that, you have to understand that the race is not to the swift, but for those who can endure to the very end. Jesus wants you to live by faith because he was justified by it. Yes, he was the son of God, but in the end, what did that matter when he was crucified on the cross? When the apostles saw him die, how do they continue? How do they go on? It's by faith. When the times come, because they will come, and the end draws near, what will we do? If we are justified by works. When our money is taken. By the people in which we helped. Turn around and scorn us. Doesn't Peter even say that the people. Of our home will be our enemies. Even Jesus Christ backs it up. If you love your father. Your mother. Your sister. Your brother. More than me. You're unworthy. Faith is supposed to lead us to Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus Christ is not just going to forgive us that we could remain in the man that we're in. It's to justify us that we could come to the fullness of God. We have to think greater than ourselves. God didn't give his only son for nothing. He gave us his son that we could have the life that keeps on giving. As it says, spread your bread upon many waters. Let this beam of light spread that someone could see it and gain hope. Not everyone could find God and have that faith the way you may have it. So it's about time you live so that they could receive it. The same way Jesus Christ was a living example of perfection, we could live to the standard. A perfection being made in this similitude walking and using the same tools in which he had so live by faith and know that God is still willing and able to do exceedingly and abundantly and above all you could ever ask or think God bless